What up though, I'm Merce, Hip Hop DX, and this is The Breakdown. A few weeks back, I claimed that the Beastie Boys were the greatest group of all time. Now, it's time to back it up. First off, the Wu-Tang Clan is not a group in my opinion, it's a crew. A group is where all members of the group are on a great majority of the songs, if not all of them. Also, I am not talking about best or favorite, I am talking greatest. Achievements, consistency, quality, and overall impact on the culture. Beastie Boys, greatest group of all time. Let's break it down. MCA, Ad Rock, and Mike D, three MCs from NYC. They didn't start out this way originally. They were a hardcore punk band. Yes, they played instruments, screamed the whole nine. Opening for acts like The Misfits, Dead Kennedys and the legendary Bad Brains. In 1983, they released the Cookie Puss EP. The title track features some scratching over a hip hop style beat they created and a member of the band placing vulgar prank calls to Carville Ice Cream. May I help you? Yes, what's your name? Hello? Hello, man, you got Cookie Puss's number? Here's my supervisor, he'll help you. <laughs> Yo, man, where's your supervisor at? I, I, I got the number anyway, baby. Believe it or not, that song became popular in nightclubs and on college radio. So much so that the group had to hire a DJ in order to be able to play the song during their punk set. That DJ was an NYU student named Rick Rubin, who soon after becoming their DJ would quit to focus on his small indie rap label called Def Jam, which he started with his friend Russell Simmons. Also, around this time, drummer Kate Schellenbach would leave the group and the boys would go full on hip hop, adopting their official rap monikers MCA, Ad Rock, and Mike D. Rick then offered them a deal on his Def Jam label. And in 1984, the group put out their 12 inch Rock Hard. From there, they released more singles, which created a buzz that got them on a slew of tours, two of the largest being supporting spots on Madonna's Virgin Tour and then on Run DMC's groundbreaking Raising Hell Tour. This was the beginning of them keeping a foot in each world, one in the hip hop world and one in the pop rock world. They went on tour with Madonna and curated a crowd of young white tweens. Then following that, they went on tour with Run DMC where these same kids came out to see them with their parents and on stage was an inflatable penis, beer cans and strippers. Yes, they were the pioneers of the pornographic hip hop performance, the same type of nasty as they wanna be antics that would land two live crew in jail years later. But while pissing off the parents of their young white fans, they still had to rock these black kids in the crowd who weren't trying to hear them. They were there to see Run DMC, LL Cool J, and Houdini. Here's what those who were there had to say. And when the Beasties first came on, they were not greeted with, with widespread approval, but usually by the end of their, of their set, they would have won the audience over. And they did that pretty quickly. We did a show in Virginia, and you had 5,000 little black girls screaming and hollering, trying to get to them. Want to have a good time and, and loving the guys just generally because of they were real with what they were trying to say. They weren't trying to be black. They were trying to be the Beastie Boys. And it worked and it translated. The music translated, not the color. Keep in mind that they got both of these gigs before they even put out a full length album. They did have some bangers out though. Hold It Now, Hit It, She's On It, Paul Revere, and The New Style. And all this momentum culminated into what Rolling Stone called Three Idiots Creating a Masterpiece. And on November 15th, 1986, the Beastie Boys released their debut LP. We all know what it's called, but don't nobody say it like legendary talk show host and comedian Joan Rivers. Their newest album is called License to Kill and it went platinum after only eight weeks. License to Kill, right? Kill. 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 That's ill, Joan. Like, well, I'm telling you, I got my stupid contacts in. Hold on. Okay, sorry about this. Their album is called License to Ill. That's a stupid name for an album. <laughs> Do I detect the note of jealousy in your voice, Joe? If it was called License to Kill, you would have gone platinum in four weeks. Anyhow. Well, it didn't go platinum in four weeks it did become the first rap record to hit number one on the Billboard charts. It also hit number two on the R&B charts. I don't believe there was a rap chart at the time. And once again, a foot in both worlds. License to Ill went on to be the biggest selling rap record of the 1980s, to this day, selling over 10 million copies. 
This is just the beginning. Now for all of you at home thinking their skin color is what got them over, let's take a second to add it up. They started out in 82 as a punk band sneaking into clubs, playing when they could, paying their dues. Then they graduated to being able to open up for some of the most legendary punk bands at the time, playing at some of the most legendary venues, like CBGB's for instance. And for all of y'all who don't know what CBGB's is, it's like one oak on meth. And if you were playing there during that time with the bands they were playing with, you were on. And just as they were beginning to bubble on the punk scene, they say, scratch that. Let's become a rap group. Now keep in mind, at the time, punk rock was much bigger than hip hop. You could count on one hand the number of successful rap groups. So it wasn't for the money. And of the groups on that one hand, zero of them were white. Major labels were not checking for rappers and definitely not white ones. So what do they do? Sign with the indie label operating out of a New York University dorm room. And yes, as the Beastie Boys grew, so did Def Jam, but it was nothing like the Def Jam we know today. So if you think their debut album selling millions of copies was easy or solely because of the color of their skin, you're dead ass wrong. As I said in the previous breakdown, it was a hard sell on both sides. Black people were not trying to hear a bunch of white boys rap and white people, they weren't trying to hear rap, period. And let's not forget that the millions of copies sold generated millions of dollars in revenue, which laid a solid foundation for the most important rap label of all time. But that said, after the release of License to Ill, the Beastie Boys left Def Jam. I've always wondered why, why the Beasties left after the first album. They left because they couldn't get along. Uh, they were young, they, had, they, they couldn't get along. Between Leo and Rick, Leo wanted to manage them and make them a big movie, at a big movie studio. Rick wanted to produce and direct their movie. I think what Russ was trying to get at was the label was trying to control them and in the true spirit of hip hop and punk rock, the group wasn't having it. After selling millions of records, they said no to the big movie deal and all the prepackaged label manufactured BS. You know who did roll with the plan though? The Fat Boys and Run DMC. Both groups had the same management as the Beasties at the time. Both did movies. And while I love and respect both groups and enjoyed their respective films as a kid, I also love and respect the Beastie Boys for standing their ground. But it's a lot easier to say no to the money when you come from an upper class or upper middle class family. When you're three kids from a less desirable background like the Fat Boys and Run DMC, it's hard to say no to that kind of money and opportunity. Whatever the case, it took a lot of courage for the Beastie Boys to make that decision. Some might say making a move like that was self-sabotage. See what I did there? They bounced to Capitol Records to create a flop. Or at least that's how the Dust Brothers produced Paul's Boutique was seen by their new label. And while the fun and rap was still there, leaving Def Jam, then creating a new sound, seemed to alienate some of their black fan base. And not being as raunchy, rock and roll, and repugnant as they were on Fight For Your Right To Party alienated some of their white fan base. Fight For Your Right To Party was their biggest hit from License To Ill. The majority of their fans wanted something else like this. You gotta fight! Instead of rehashing their biggest hit, the Beastie Boys returned with a sample heavy LP, possibly the most sample heavy album in the history of hip hop. According to Mike Simpson of the Dust Brothers, there are 100 to 300 samples on the album. Rather than give the world more of the same, the Beastie Boys decided to give the world more cowbell with their lead single, Hey Ladies. Hey ladies. Usually when a group has such huge success with such a specific sound, they don't decide to go hard left on their follow-up album. And it's probably why Paul's Boutique didn't do the numbers at first. It barely went gold. But 10 years later, it was double platinum and recognized by critics worldwide as one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time. This is another lane they pioneered so that years later, people like Kanye West could do things like hop from graduation to 808s and heartbreaks, which just like Paul's Boutique, a lot of y'all hated at first. But now, young artists from Tyler to Uzi are citing it as one of their biggest influence. And also, just like Paul's Boutique, 10 years later, 808s and Heartbreaks is approaching double platinum. From there, we can fast forward to 1992 with the release of Check Your Head, their third album, where they return to their roots of live instrumentation, adding keyboardist Money Mark and producer Mario C to the roster. 
They smacked the world in the face with the psychedelic sounds of their second single, So What You Want. <laughs> Once again, sounding like no one else in the game and winning. The album went triple platinum. They did two tours to support the album, one with the Rollins Band, one with Cypress Hill. One foot in the rock world, one foot in the rap world. And speaking of rock, rap, rap, rock, they were the first dudes on that level to do the DJ, rapper, and live instrument thing. So that whole rap, rock shit, yeah, that's the Beastie Boys. Setting the stage for such groups as Limp Bizkit, Korn, Linkin Park, and Rage Against the Machine. No biggie. Next up was Ill Communication, two years later in 1994. The first single, Sabotage, is probably one of the most epic songs and videos ever. This 70s theme masterpiece was director Spike Jonze's first rap video. This video with the Beasties made him hot in the hip hop world, and Spike would go on to direct many a classic rap video, like the rap in reverse, Drop, by the West Coast legends The Far Side, the posthumous heartwarming classic he did for Biggie Sky's The Limit, and Otis from Watch the Throne, the collab LP with the great Jay-Z and Mr. Kanye West himself. While Spike didn't shoot the visual for the album's final single, Root Down, it was still just as important because it showed and told the world that they had not forgotten where they came from and the culture that made it all possible. Yes, that was Bobo, currently of Cypress Hill on percussion. But he got his big break and in with Cypress by touring with the Beastie Boys. After this album, they released a few EPs that featured some instrumental tracks, some punk songs, and some remixes. And four years later in 1998, they released Hello Nasty. It earned them two Grammy Awards, one for best performance by a rap duo or group for their single Intergalactic, and the second Grammy was for best alternative music album. This was the first time one group had won an award in both categories. Keeping a foot planted in each world finally paid off in a big way. At this point, no other rap group from the 80s was still going platinum or receiving Grammys for their new work. Once again, you may say it was because of the color of their skin. But what about Vanilla Ice and Third Base? White rappers that came in the game after the BC started and their careers were virtually over by this point. They went on to release the To The Five Boroughs album in 2004. That went platinum. Then the mix-up in 2007, which was another instrumental project. And finally, their last album, Hot Sauce Committee Part 2 in 2011, which marks the end of their recording career due to the tragic passing of MCA in 2012. But before we close out, there's more. There's the Tibetan Freedom Concerts that MCA put together featuring some of the biggest bands in the world and raised millions of dollars for the cause. There was Mike D's venture into fashion with a hugely successful extra large clothing brand, which is still around today. The group's label imprint Grand Royal, which for a brief time was home to underground rappers like Mr. Liff and Abstract Rude. They also had a magazine by the same name and one Grand Royal issue Oxford credits with coining the term mullet. Their DJ after Rick Rubin was the New York Dr. Dre, who went on to be a co-host on Yo! MTV Raps. Their next DJ was Hurricane, who was also part of one of my favorite gimmick groups of the 1990s, the Afro. Why do you wear that Afro? It's none of your business. So leave me alone. Stop calling me on the phone. Asking me questions about my pro. Do you use Jared for beer? Oh no. Stop sweating me and pass me my dick. So I got to look at my Afro real quick. You know what I mean. But I can't start this show without my Afro sheen. The last DJ was the Invisible Scratch Pickle and DMC Champ mix master Mike. Their producer Mario C went on to produce three albums for Jack Johnson and Zach De La Roca's One Day as a Lion. The hard stats. 27 years in the rap game. Over 20 million units sold. The biggest selling rap group of all time. No other group even comes close. The longevity, the numbers, the creative boundaries they push. Is it because the color of their skin? Yes and no. Ironically, the same factors that helped create hip hop, like lack of music programs in inner city schools, gave the private school kids like the Beastie Boys the unfair advantage and tools to expand and evolve musically. White privilege. 
but there's also the super trendy fans in the black community that expect their artists to change with the times to stay relevant. A lot of white fans don't. They just want their artists to stay creative. This has nothing to do with white privilege and everything to do with those fans in the black community that need to learn to respect and support our legends instead of only supporting the newest next shit. But what about LL Cool J? He's a black artist from the same era whose career has lasted just as long. Aha. But in order to remain relevant to his core urban fan base, he had to begin collaborating with younger rappers, hot at the moment producers, and R&B singers. What about Jay-Z? His career now spans two decades. Yes, he's always collaborated with younger artists and hot producers, but especially at the beginning of his second decade with albums like Kingdom Come and American Gangster, when sales and acclaim started to drift off. He had to collaborate with R&B artists like Alicia Keys and Justin Timberlake. Then team up with the new king Kanye West for a collab album to right the ship and make some of his biggest selling records ever. But the Beastie Boys never had to collaborate with young hot artists or producers to maintain their success. White privilege? Not so much. Once again, it's the urban demographic being too trendy for its own good. But them getting booked for the Madonna tour without even having an album out? Definitely white privilege. But the subsequent tours they were booked for, when other black rap acts weren't being booked, had less to do with the color of their skin and more to do with the outbreak of violence at rap shows nationwide. This was a direct symptom of the crack epidemic that was sweeping our communities at the time. White privilege? Yes. But the Beastie Boys couldn't control violence breaking out at other rappers' shows, so they had to take the opportunities being presented to them. And like it or not, them accepting these opportunities still opened doors for the black rap acts that couldn't later on down the line. And they did so without selling out, keeping it hip hop and b-boy as fuck. And if you disagree with me, let's hear Chuck D from Public Enemy's take on it. It's impossible to talk about those dudes without the magnitude of LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys made it possible for them. Come on now. So I don't wanna hear somebody come out telling, that's, that's evolution. But the revolution is LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys. Those are revolutionary MCs. Jay-Z and Eminem are evolutionary uh, MCs. That's cool, but it's it evolved out of the creation that you know created the standard. So that's and that's due respect to all of them. But you know I'm you know I cover thirty some odd years and following hip hop so. Even Eminem and Jay-Z will tell you they'll agree to that. Do I think the Beastie Boys are the best? No. Are they my favorite of all time? No, but they are close. Did they have an unfair advantage? Yes. Do I feel like they show love and respect for the culture throughout their career? Yes. Their staying power, their dope live show, their innovations, their philanthropy, their numbers. When I sit back and look at the facts objectively, I have to say at this point in hip hop history, the Beastie Boys are the greatest rap group of all time. You might say hell yeah, you might say fuck no. Let's talk about it in the comments below. And as always, for more music and news, check out hiphopdx.com.